Have you ever wondered about the subject of gay Christianity? Ever wondered about how to share your faith with your gay friends? If so, stay tuned because in this video, I talk about some of the most commonly believed myths about the LGBT community, as well as why you should never call a gay person a homosexual. Check it out. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of That Christian Vlogger. You're ready to come and join me and experience faith in the first person. Today, I am welcoming two very special guests today. Uh, my brother Leon and Kristen here. Thank you guys so much for joining me in this conversation. This is a continuation in our series on gay Christianity. And I brought these two here because I think it would be a great time for us to come and talk together as well as share a variety of perspectives uh, on this very important and oftentimes very touchy subject. So I'm gonna just share a little bit of how I know you guys. Leon is actually a, a close friend of mine, I would say. I met you within this last year. And one reason why I invited Leon onto this discussion is because you have been in, how would you describe your relationship? Well, no, I've been in a monogamous relationship for 30 years. We just got married last Friday. Thank there you go. <laughs> 30 years, that's a long time. Um, so he's going to be sharing uh, with us his perspective on things, and uh, we've also invited Kristen onto this. And Kristen, I met you just a few months ago at uh, a weekend, would you call it a retreat, or what would you call it? Dialogue. A dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, this dialogue is called? Oriented to Love. And would you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Oriented to Love um, helps small groups of theologically diverse Christians, uh, and also diverse in terms of sexual and gender orientation, come together, usually at a place of beauty and rest, for two and a half days, and we listen to each other in love. That's the goal, to listen to each other in love. So let's dive into this. Uh, we, I'm trying to seek to understand, and I know, Leon, over the last year or so, we've had a couple of discussions on this, and there are some things that I've, tr I've done out of, uh, and I've said out of like a good heart and coming from a great place, trying to love, but there are just some things that I'm ignorant about. And I think there's a lot of things that many of us Christians are ignorant about when it comes to the LGBT community. For example, the first one that jumps to my mind is when I use the phrase like homosexual lifestyle, I'm trying to say that in a very polite and uh, loving way. I I'm trying not to be crude or crass, but apparently when I use this type of language, and I'm sure you can share with us some other things, that's not actually how it's received. So would you, would you mind sharing with me about that? I mean, I, I shouldn't speak for all gay people, but, you know, I'll say gay people in my orbit. Um, when you use the word homosexual lifestyle, it just hits us negatively. Same-sex attraction six, hit, uh, hits us negatively because it's all about behavior, your perceived notion of what our behavior is, but it really has nothing to do with me necessarily. I'm gay because I fall in love with people of the same sex. All the rest of it is up for... Whatever, you, whatever it is you and your partner want to do. So we may be having sex, maybe we're not. We may be having the type of sex you have in your head, <laughs> and maybe we're not. So, you know, other than the fact that I fall in love with people of the same sex, I, my lifestyle to me is the same as everybody else. Yeah. One thing that I've kind of, I think, come to understand in, in these types of discussions is that when I use these ty this type of language, the gay lifestyle or the homosexual lifestyle, it's really more like an attack at, at not even not even actions like things that I do, but like who I am inside. Like I am, like everything about who I am is completely wrong and evil and yes. like a curse from God. And like even from my perspective, like that's definitely not what I'm intending to say when I'm saying these things. Because you know, there's there's nothing wrong with having a very close friend of the same sex. You know, we we will probably talk about this later in our, our discussion, but you know, the Bible talks about how David had a very close relationship with Jonathan. Um, and, and like, that was something that was very important and meaningful to them. And so, so th clearly there's nothing wrong with having friends or close people of the same sex, like hanging out and, and doing life together. Like if you're trying to start a dialogue with gay people, even if it's just to be friends or whatever, if you're using those terms, you're turning them off. Mm -hmm. I would say, generally speaking, it's code for us, same sex attractive, sexual purity that's code for you don't like gay people mm. so in your for me thank you thank you and for many people that i know yeah <laughs> you've met a lot of people in the lgbt community like is this something that's common or is this just kind of like leon's like pet thing that's just about him or is this something that's kind of echoed amongst a lot of the the gay christians that are out there yes i think it's a very common um reaction to that phrase 
Um, I think it, it does have something specific in mind when you say practicing, are you a practicing homosexual? Are you living the gay lifestyle? There is something specific in mind when in fact you were talking earlier about, you know, it's like when I'm cooking my eggs for breakfast, is that the gay lifestyle? When I'm driving to work, is that the gay lifestyle? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of assumptions wrapped up in those. And, and in my those perception spaces. of the assumption that people make when they say that, that means I know you're having anal sex and you're having anal sex with many people because it never, usually they're not thinking about the women, only the men. That's mm -hmm. what I think you, I think you mean mm -hmm. or people mean when they say that. And that tells me that you don't know what you're talking about because not all gay men have sex, not all gay men are promiscuous, just like not all straight people do things you may think they do. Yeah. So it just says that you're, you don't know, you don't have any, you don't know any gay people or you haven't been listening to us, otherwise you wouldn't use those terms. So, so for me, it's been helpful in clarifying really what I believe a little bit more and where I feel like the issue is. And for me, it's not even about the lifestyle. It's not about what you do in 99% of the day. For me, what I, where I come from and what I believe that the Bible teaches from my perspective is that, yeah, that sex is supposed to be something that is reserved. And, and this is going to be like a very traditional way of defining marriage, but like in a male, female, long-term relationship before God. And that's kind of where my focus of the discussion is. And so how do, how do I function within that understanding of this is what God has said marriage is supposed to be like, or this is what God has said that is good, or this is not good. And, and how do I, how do I honor that and not be limiting God and putting him in a box as you, as you saying by like, I have to be humble. We all be humble and admit that you don't know what God intended to be variation to be. You don't know. It doesn't say in the Bible that I intended it to be this way or that way. Yes. I mean, I sit here and I go, God created Adam and Eve, and he wanted Adam to have, it's great and it's wonderful and it's swell, and I bless you and I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I just don't limit it to that. Mm -hmm. So, and when people think of marriage, especially traditional Christians now, they forget about what marriage was in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. It was a contract, women were property. Throughout the centuries, more than one woman, people were married and, you know, went through the Bible without being condemned. And we sort of like forget all that because mm -hmm. we're now in the 21st century and we don't do it. I'm not advising that we do, but mm -hmm. in America, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. But we forget all of that. So there's variety to what marriage meant, what it didn't, etc. And it's changed over time. And I love the fact that you're married and have a wife. But I'm just telling you that for some of us, that's just not possible. We don't do that. And we believe that. God did not intend us, intend for us to be alone and miserable because we were born and we can't do what you do. Hmm. So when, for example, if you decided not to get married, no one has a problem with that, even though she's not procreating and not doing any of the things that God intended her to do. And if I asked you, why are you okay with that? So maybe you would say, well, it's something that she can't help. But when I say it's something I can't help, it's a problem. I can't help it. I can't follow it. Emily, your wife, is a lovely, gorgeous, sweet woman who plays the piano. But I, I definitely agree. <laughs> but I could never fall in love with her because I'm a gay man, so it's just impossible. I see. Okay. So in this discussion, what are some other things that are important for me to understand? That as I'm seeking to, to love you well as a brother in Christ, as have community with you, what are some other things that I should probably be aware of uh, in, in our interactions? I would just say to be educated about gay people and before you start talking to us, because like the homosexual lifestyle, the same sex attraction, oh, you chose to be gay, or you're gay because you were molested, or you're gay because you have, you know, those are all stereotypes that are pretty well debunked scientifically, and if you ever talk to a whole, you know, a whole host of gay folks, you know, they would tell you, so for example, oh, you're gay because you had, you were sexually abused, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, I like to dissect that. I'm like, one, that makes no sense. So before someone of the same sex abused me, and I'm a gay man, I liked the shape and the look of a woman. And I didn't like the shape and the look of a man. But then I saw a man naked, and all of a sudden I like men? That makes no sense. Mm. No sense whatsoever. So then, if you talk to gay, I know people who are straight and were sexually abused, and they're straight. I know gay people who were sexually abused, and they're gay. I know, you know, if that were the case, it's been hundreds of thousands of years. We'd have been able to put that together already. They go, yeah, that's why. So stuff like that, when you come at gay people, you're not, and I think a lot of this is, it's like people dealing with 
their own fears and their own feelings sort of threatened with their way of life. It's never about ministering to the gay people in a loving way. It's always about taking a stand and saying, I believe in this. Because if you were going to love us and approach us, you'd have to know who we were and why mm -hmm. we were that way. So you can talk in our language about you know, what's going on. Well, Leon, you said get educated before you talk to us. And I'm wondering, um, isn't talking to sexual minorities maybe. the best way to get That's to understand? That's maybe an overstatement. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe getting to know, but understanding that when you talk to us, maybe you don't know. I think that that's really important because like certainly before meeting you and kind of really having actual conversations with many of my other gay friends, like I had an idea of what that meant or what that looked like. And I find many, 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 many times that as I come to talk to the individual, that a lot of my preconceived ideas are actually really, really, really shattered. Uh, I think a lot of Christians have this perspective of gay people as being incredibly promiscuous, like flaunting and like just being very crude and... There are gay people like that. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But, but not everyone is like that. Not there are everyone a lot of heterosexual fit. people like that too. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I find that a lot of my uh, ideas are actually just really ignorance. It, it, it's like I, I don't know anything about this person and if I just took the time to sit and to listen and to talk with this person, not trying to make a point, but just to get, to get to know that person, that makes a huge difference. And that's exactly what we see with Jesus. Jesus is the type of person, and you mentioned this earlier, Jesus is the type of person who spends a lot of time with, with kind of the uh, outcasts of society, the, the, the lepers, the prostitutes, the, the thieves, the, the whatever the case is, and Jesus is spending a lot of time with them. Uh, you made the point uh, before the camera started that Jesus was called uh, and kind of accused of being a drunkard and all these different kinds of things. And, and it's not because Jesus was constantly preaching downwards to them, but it was most likely because Jesus spent a lot of time with those people. And I don't think he called the drunks to the synagogue to talk to them. I think he went where they were drinking and talked to them. That's what I think. He was where they were. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's the model that we see is you have to draw close to someone in order to understand them, in order to love them unconditionally. And then after that, after that process takes place, then are they even willing to listen to what you have to say about these bigger picture things? And I think and a lot of works, times... That works both ways too. So you may want to be loving to me and we talk, etc. And you know, we, you share your view on this subject with me, hoping that something will happen. Maybe it works the other way around too. Right? We talk. Then you, get to know you, you, were sharing, you were sharing a really interesting uh, uh, story about how when you first came to, to the church that we are members of, that you actually prejudged someone quite a bit of time before actually getting to know this person. So would you yeah, mind sharing So it works both ways. So, you know, you straight folks, you make assumptions about us, and I'll only speak for me, and I make assumptions. So, for, so a lot of the times, especially when you're new at church, I assume that you're a homophobic bigot because you're a member of my church and it's a very homophobic, bigoted church. I won't mention the name. And so I assume that. So there's a person in our congregation that I saw and I said, yep, he's a homophobic bigot. And I annoyed, I, uh, I avoided him and, you know, I thought all sorts of things. And then probably two years into it, he posted something on Facebook that was positive for, like he was thinking about the theology of this and... And, and it wasn't even like a pro-gay thing necessarily, no, it was just, just like, open-mindedness. Yes, that he had thought about one of the verses they used. And so then I felt bad that I had prejudged him. So I took him to lunch and said, well, you know, I'm sorry I prejudged you. I thought you were a homophobic bigot and you're not. And so now we're cool and I consider him to be a friend of mine. And, um, you know, and that's the way, so it works both ways. It's not just y'all judging us. We judge you, mm. although I'd say we have. <laughs> Should I have not said that? <laughs> no, but it's true. So and yeah. that's the struggle in this conversation. For someone like me, I want someone like you to figure out how to love and empathize with me. But then I have to figure out how to love and empathize with you mm. or someone who holds your view. I think that's really good to point out is that, that it really is a two-way street. Like we both, like whatever side of the discussion you, you come from, we both have a lot to learn and we have a lot of kind of myths that we need to dispel, that myths that I just immediately believe about you because you're, you're gay, that, that you must be doing 101 other different things, all of which are just terrible, evil, horrible things, you know, but really I have to get to know you first. And if my desire really is to be able to, to, to reflect God's love to you, I have to be able to come from a place where I'm willing to listen and to talk to you before making any kind of judgments at all. And that's definitely a, a two-way street.
And you have to do it in the sense that it's not, it can't be, it's like if I befriend you, and one of the things we talk about is this whole, they call it queer theology, I think that's what they call it, queer theology in some circles. I can't go, I'm going to be friends with Justin because I want him to understand and come to my view. And then when it turns out that you don't, then I like sort of turn you off and go, mm. well, you know, he's a prideful jerk. And, and the other way around, for someone who's Christian to become friends with me solely or on some level so that they think if they're friendly enough, you know, we'll exchange whatever's and, you know, you'll become straight all of a sudden. And that's really deceitful. What, yeah. Whoever's doing yeah. it, it's deceitful. And, and it doesn't even have to be about, like, the whole gay issue. If, right. if I'm trying to be someone's friend who is a non-believer and I'm only their friend in the hopes that I'll convert them, that's not really a genuine friendship. That's not the way that, that, that God goes about it. Like, the Bible talks about how he makes the sun to rise on, on the righteous and the wicked. Like, God is good to people in general, whether they accept him or they don't. And I think a lot of times, you're, you're definitely you're nailing it on the head, like a lot of times we as Christians, we are only good or we're only kind and compassionate to people as long as there's hope that I can convert them or win them to my side. And the moment that doesn't take place and I find out that they're stubborn or whatever the case is, like, well, then, then get out of my house. And uh, that's, that's not the way that we should go about creating genuine relationships and loving people in, authentic, nothing, in an authentic way. One thing that we were talking about earlier that I thought was really profound is that the way that Jesus treated kind of the marginalized community, whether it was anything, he, he treated them in such a way that at the end of the conversation, at the end of hanging out with them, these people loved Jesus back and they actually wanted to follow him. And I think that this is the way that, that many Christians approach the LGBT community is, is completely uh, like wrong because we're, we're, we're seeing a very different result. You know, you'll know them by their fruits, right? Uh, if, if the way that Jesus loved marginalized people was that they like flocked to him and they loved him in return, how, how, does, how does the LGBT community in general respond to the Christian community? They, they don't flock to the church and say, oh, you guys are, 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 are loving, you're, you're homophobic, you're bigoted, you hate us, you're, you're judging, you're whatever the case is. And it's a lot of anger and vitriol towards the church, which makes me think that the way that the church has historically treated these, this group of people is not the way that Jesus would have done it. And I think that's like like the one, maybe like the most important thing for people who are side B or whatever it is to think about. Because, you know, the Bible says, by your fruits or by their fruits you shall know them, whatever it says. Mm -hmm. And if you think about just the history over the thousands of years of the way the church has treated gay people, your fruit is horrible. Because mm -hmm. where are we all? We're not in your churches. We're somewhere else. And, you know, Jesus... Uh, transformed people because of his love. True love transforms. And I think especially in the evangelical, more evangelical churches, we feel this compunction to speak the love and truth, to speak the truth in love, um, when in fact real love listens and mm. gets to know. I'll tell you stories. I was at a youth center downtown, and it was, I, I was sent over there to talk to this gay kid who talked about Jesus all the time. And I figured, yeah, you talk, go talk, you talk about Jesus, go talk to him. So I'm talking to him. And his father was a pastor. He came out. And he took, his father took him down the basement to beat the gay out of him, whatever. So I'm talking, oh, sorry, you kind of pass that over. But like, this is a real thing that happened. When, yeah. when you're saying beat the gay out of him, like what? Because some people he, might not, not really know what you're referring to. Him, physically beat him in the basement so bad that the government had to come take him away. And I think side B people, here I go judging again, but I think a lot of times side B people, people, B people hearing that story are not going to have compassion. They're going to say, he loved the sin so much, he couldn't give it up, so therefore his relationship with God suffered. When mm -hmm. that's not it, it is, for example, I knew another girl who was drama with her family. They decided she was possessed of the devil, and mm -hmm. they took her to be exercised and all that, and they were torturing her. And through that whole time, she's praying, Lord, deliver me from this torture. Deliver me from this pain. And she wasn't delivered. Mm. And at the end, she was done. Mm. Because she felt God wasn't with her. And so it's not necessarily that, oh, the sin was so important. They were feeling pain. And they were praying for someone to deliver from the pain. She even, this person asked me, well, why do you think that happened? I don't remember what I yeah. said. I don't know. But... And that's the way it was for me. Jesus was a very important part of my life until I was like 20 or something. And then all of this, no one was really mean to me. But yeah. you, know, you come to the conclusion that one, you can't have one without the other. And then 
Mm. Yeah, I think I think so many Christians have this misunderstanding that gay Christians just must not really love God and must not really care. They're just so like attached to this thing that, that they're not willing to allow. Like, no, many gay Christians, especially the younger ones, are doing all that they can because there's such a, a huge emphasis like this is evil, this is wrong, that they're, they're really earnestly, honestly trying to, to pray the gay out or to, to do whatever they can in order to change. And, and like, it, it's, it just doesn't work. And so when it doesn't work for them, and we say it must be because you're not sincere. And they say, wow, then I really must not be sincere. God must really not be with me. God must really have just like, just like forsaken me. And then what else is the conclusion that they can make other than to leave the church that, that is kicking them out to leave the God that is forsaking that individual. That's as they call it in some circles, that's the, the tape playing in their head. Mm -hmm. And it plays over and over and over again. And it's just like, for me, I just reached the conclusion that God cannot be that, possibly be that mean and that vindictive that he, I'm gay and I'm praying to him not to be gay. And then every time I fall in love, I'm guilt, I feel guilty and bad. And I, crawl in the closet and I pray and this and that and the other. He couldn't possibly mm -hmm. have intended my life to be like that. Otherwise, he, he wouldn't take it away and he doesn't. Mm -hmm. So he can't be that mean, cruel, and evil just to me. That's, I, I don't, that's not the God I want to be around. Yeah. Our time is running short, so would you kind of help bring us to a close? Um, how, what, what are some of the most important things that we should be kind of focusing on? We've talked about a lot, but from your perspective, talking to many people on both sides of the discussion, what are some things that are important for us to kind of take away from this discussion? Well, I think the importance of approaching instead of standing back and judging. When was the last time you felt loved, well loved by somebody who's judging you, right? right. We can't really do the, those two things at the same time. So moving towards people in genuine curiosity to get to know them instead of standing back here and judging. Um, and I think also acknowledging that the gospel is about who Jesus is and who he said he was and not making this particular thing a gospel issue more than anything else would be. Do we believe that Christ is our savior? That, that's, that's what makes somebody a Christian mm -hmm. and that's what um, transforms your life when you understand that you've been loved without condition, without a goal in mind. You are just transformed by, by yeah. love, whether it comes from Christ or through another person from Christ. Definitely. Hey guys, that's all the time that we have for today for this video, but don't worry if you want to hear more about this subject. We did film a question and answer session after this video, so if you'd like to see that, go and visit us at thatchristianvlogger.com. Also, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I'm sure there were things that not only you agreed with, but also disagreed with, and I'd love to know what stood out to you the most. I also did ask Leon and Kristen if there were any resources or books that they would recommend for people who are wanting to study this out more, so there will be links to books in the description box below. Lastly, if you would like to participate in a dialogue like this, I would strongly encourage you to check out Kristen's ministry, Oriented to Love. She hosts dialogues like this all over the country, and no matter what side of the conversation you fall on, side A, side B, or you don't even know, I'm sure that this would be something that would be a huge blessing to you. Links again in the description box below. Until next time, I'm that Christian vlogger, and I want to encourage you to experience faith in the first person. God bless.